why. We've all looked up with fascination at the wonderful flying machines that pass overhead. I'm Marilyn Creel, and today I'm going to take you on a tour of the wonderful, unusual aviation museum. We'll fly back in time to see some gems from California's aviation history. We'll fly forward to see how tomorrow's generation is learning and preparing for aviation's future. And then we'll fly a little bit sideways to see some interesting machines that didn't quite make it into aviation history. Stay tuned. Welcome to The Better Part, a program by and for seniors and devoted to exploring the many facets of those better years of our lives. We're inside the Hiller Aviation Museum now, and I'm speaking with Operations Director Willie Turner. And I wanted to ask you now, there's actually two missions that you have here at the museum, and it's actually called an institute, isn't it? Uh, we are an educational institution. Yeah, we're a 501c3 nonprofit educational institution. Mm -hmm. okay. And you have all kinds of facilities to teach children who would come in, and yes. as well as this wonderful museum. Now, uh, who is the founder? Our founder, uh, his name on the building, Hiller, is Stanley Hiller Jr., who was a pioneer in helicopters. And uh, he actually built and flew his first helicopter when he was 19 years old. So quite an amazing achievement back in 1944 when he was actually the first to ever fly a helicopter on the West Coast. So he was our founder, and um, he also was a very successful venture capitalist, which helped uh, finance this institution. So uh, that's where our, um, our beginnings came from. Well, I know you have an exhibit uh, dedicated to him that we'll be seeing later mm -hmm. on, so you can tell us more about him. And then, uh, okay, he initiated it and got it started, but how was it um, financed at this point? How is it funded? Well, again, we're a, we're a nonprofit, uh, and we're just a private um, foundation. Donations? Donations is the major way we get uh, our funding, is donations. And then what about acquisitions? How, how do you get your... And well, uh, being a museum, it kind of comes out of the woodwork. Uh, people want to give you things, especially small things like library books and uh, all the way up to big airplanes. So we get a lot of uh, acquisitions. As a matter of fact, just recently, uh, we just acquired a brand new jet, an L-39 uh, Czechoslovakian jet. So that's our newest exhibit that will be on display here at the museum. Now, I've seen a lot of volunteers here. and. Uh, how does one become a volunteer? Do they have to be pilots or airplane mechanics? No, that's a great question because we have both. We have everything. We have the, the retired airline pilots. We have retired jet mechanics, airline mechanics. Uh, but we also have just people that like to be either around people and uh, become docents and they're interested in aviation uh, to our restoration shop where there's woodworkers and welders and, and people that have never built anything aviation-wise but can still continue their trade by being here. Uh, so we have a really dedicated group of volunteers. You have a very large gift shop. I don't even know if you call it maybe a department <laughs> yeah, department. That's very good, very good, yes. Yeah, it is. It's 3,000 square feet gift shop. and. Um, it is a remarkable gift shop. We have quite a few people. There's no charge to go into the gift shop, so you don't have to pay to come to the museum to go to the gift shop. So we have a lot of people, especially around holidays or birthdays, uh, that come just to the gift shop to get things because we have such a great assortment of aviation-related uh, gifts. And then you have a library, mm -hmm. and I know that you also have a party room. Uh -huh. So, like for birthday parties, it would be a wonderful place to bring all kinds of things. Of bowling or yeah. <laughs> we do uh, we do kid birthdays here. We have a room for that, uh, and we also just do big events. Um, I know that you do put on certain things like the jet pack mm -hmm. and different things. What? Uh, who organizes those? All these extra events. Oh, it's a team effort, but usually a lot of it falls into my lap. Well. Um, we're here to see the museum. Okay. And uh, where will we begin? I guess. Let's begin at the beginning. Yeah, we'll go back in time. So All let's right. go on a tour. Okay. 
So our tour actually starts in 1869, which is long before the Wright brothers ever thought about any kind of flight. And it actually starts right here in the Bay Area. It was right down the street in the Burlingame Millbury area uh, called Shell Mound Park. And an aircraft called an aeroplane, actually called an aeroplane uh, by Frederick Marriott, uh, flew. And on its first flight, it flew for over a mile. And the Wright Brothers' first flight was only 120 feet. So this was an amazing feat for 1869. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, then how come you don't hear about Frederick Marriott, you hear about the Wright Brothers? Well, there was one main thing, and that was it wasn't a manned flight. It was an unmanned flight. They, it's called the Avatar Herms Jr. And it kind of looks like a blimp, actually. A lot of people think it's a blimp, but it, it did have a delta-shaped wing, and it had um, a steam engine that turned these propellers, and it had an elevons, which are a combination of aileron and elevators, and it had a controllable tail. But they had to run underneath it with ropes to steer it. But this is 1869. I mean, you have to remember that anybody that even came to watch it fly had to come either by horse and buggy or in a steam train. So this was an early, early time, and, and to see something flying over their head was a truly amazing feat. One little boy that came to the flight uh, was 12 years old. He was so excited about it and so interested in it that he went home, he built a model of the Avatar, he, um, he went to the beach and studied how uh, birds flew and so forth. Well, he went on to become a professor at the University of Santa Clara, and his name was John Montgomery. And John Montgomery uh, is the first to actually be credited to have controlled flight, but not powered. It was like a glider, a hang glider. And he'd jump off a cliff and he would fly. Uh, and he did that in 1883. And that's 20 years before the Wright brothers flew. Uh, and being a professor, he wrote many, many papers about um, flight and so forth that it said that the Wright brothers had actually studied some of his work uh, and his gliders. And we actually have representation of him uh, right here, and that is his 1883 glider. My goodness. It's quite an amazing feat. Not a very comfortable yeah. ride, no. <laughs> but, but quite an amazing feat for 1883. Oh, my goodness. And, and he went on, we can head this way, he went on to build uh, the Santa Clara in 1905, and the Santa Clara was actually built by university students. You're kidding. And uh, the mechanism to get the, the Santa Clara up in the air was using a uh, hot air balloon. And the hot air balloon would lift it up as high as two, 3,000 feet. And then uh, the pilot, John Maloney there, he was a circus of that, hence the cute little outfit he's wearing, would cut himself loose and he'd fly down over the University of Santa Clara and come oh to a landing. Goodness. So oh. quite an amazing feat. Very, very dangerous too though, very dangerous. Um, yeah, you caught the wind wrong. Well, and, and actually, uh, in, in 1905, uh, one of his flights, he got caught up in the tether line from the balloon, and he ended up spinning in, and, and that was the end of Mr. Maloney. Oh. Um, and you find, as we go the through this, a lot of them, the, well, a lot of them ended that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but these guys had to go through that so we could enjoy getting on a 747 today and oh. go for an easy flight. Oh, uh, someone had to do the testing. Uh, and actually, the same feat happened with Mr. Maloney here. Uh, Montgomery, I mean, in 1911, he was flying this glider uh, down in Evergreen, where the Evergreen Junior College is in San Jose today. And uh, he had a mishap and hit his head on a bolt on landing, and uh, that, that killed him in, in 1911. Uh, so that was the end of, uh, of um, our professor. But he had amazing feet that, of the things that he had built long before the Wright brothers even flew. And he was the one who saw the Avatar fly in 1869. So kind of an interesting tie there yeah. and all in the Bay Area that it took well, place. Well, that's why it makes me feel proud uh, of this area because you think of all that we have, you know, Silicon Valley and all the aeronautical things, NASA. Yes, all the yes. Things and, and all our brilliant people who come out of the university. You bring up a very good point. And even in today's modern technology and airplanes that fly, a lot of the systems and the technology to make these like fighter jets fly, or even your basic airliners with all the uh, GPS guidance systems, everything they have is developed here in Silicon Valley. So even though they're not building the airplane, they're building the systems that go in the airplane. So it still has a, a strong hand on, on uh, aviation as, yeah. as today, so it's yeah. neat. And another point which you are interesting you bring up is the development side of it. Uh, and we like to tell the kids that about, you know, if you're a computer, computer developer today and your system crashes, you probably just have to work really hard and long hours to get it back up and running. 
uh, when they crashed the developers in, in the early days, that was usually the end of them. So they were, they were true pioneers in what they did. This was the site of the very first air meet ever held in Northern California. And uh, planes from all over the world uh, came, uh, Euro well, basically Europe and, and America, uh, but they came for this big historic air meet in Tan Fran in 1911. Um, that's why you can see the interesting pushers and Blario and, and different types of airplanes in this picture. Uh, but what's neat about this picture for us is its historic value here of the, of the San Francisco Bay Area. Tan Fran was a very uh, famous racetrack. Seabiscuit, the famous racehorse, used to race at this racetrack. Um, and also, uh, in World War II, it was a Japanese intern camp. Um, and then uh, it is now a shopping mall. <laughs> so not such a glorious uh, end to it, but a, but a really interesting place. And if you notice in the very top left of the picture, it says exposition site Tan Fran 1915. This area was bidding for the Pan American uh, exposition that ended up going to the marina and why they built the marina in San Francisco. Um, but it's interesting that that hill right there has always been a billboard hill because now it says South San Francisco, the industrial city. Uh, so it's always been a billboard up there on that hill. Now what we're in front of is the Diamond. And the Diamond is an interesting airplane uh, for a number of reasons. One, that it is uh, uh, native to Northern California, uh, was built out in the, the Pittsburgh area of California. Uh, and it was called the Diamond. As a matter of fact, it's called the Black Diamond because it was uh, the Black Diamond Mines that were out in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, and so they actually called it the Black Diamond. It was donated, well, in its day, uh, some people laugh to say that it was the first to ever deliver airmail because it flew over the University of California, Berkeley, and dropped a letter down to the chancellor in about 1911 or so. Uh, so hence they're saying, hey, that was airmail. Um, but it also uh, flew over Mount Tamalpais, uh, reaching over 3,500 feet. And in an airplane like that, that's really high. Uh, and then it, w it won a couple of contests, and then it was put into a crate. And that's one of the reasons why we still have it today in such you know historic shape uh, is put into a crate. Um, and but it was put in this crate for over 50 years, and it was donated to the Smithsonian Institute. And they never opened the crate. Well, when we found out about this airplane, we wanted to have it here in our museum, so they gave it to us on loan. Well, when we opened the crate, we found out it looked like it had been a crate for 50 years. The wood was rotted; it was a complete mess, and we were wondering if we were going to be able to save this airplane. Well, as you can see, our restoration team, all volunteers turn it into this beautiful, beautiful airplane. Uh, so we have it on a long-term loan from the Smithsonian Air and Space. What we're standing in front of now is the Gonzales biplane, and it's named after Willie and Arthur Gonzales, who were two 15-year-old brothers who built this airplane. Just amazing, and they built it in 1912. And, uh, you know, in those days they couldn't go on Google to figure out how to build an airplane, right? These kids had to see pictures in the newspapers of what airplanes looked like and they went to that Tan Fran meet in 1911 and saw these airplanes and they just took notes about how to build an airplane and they built this airplane and flew it. And this is the Stanford 1915 wind tunnel. Stanford was actually working on propellers in 1915 to see different thrusts, you know, the, uh, the different um, properties that a, a, a propeller could give. Uh, by different pitches and angles that the, the propeller blades bend. Yeah. So this was 1915, and everything inside this is original. Uh, this was all donated from Stanford to us. And uh, very interesting that 1915, they were working on uh, propeller technology that early. Because remember, again, the, the Wright brothers' first flight was at the end of 1903. So this was a very, you know, within a little over 10 years, they were working on this at Stanford. And all those are the original propellers. Well, that's what they were testing. And the, the, the prop for the wind tunnel, the fan, this is the fan that created all the wind for the wind tunnel, this beautiful piece of, of, uh, gorgeous. of gorgeous. Uh, and, and when we got it, it uh, looked like firewood. It was in such bad oh. shape. And uh, that's like the, uh, the, what we talked about earlier about the volunteers at the museum. Uh, this particular volunteer uh, was a woodworker, a cabinet maker his whole life. So he came in and he restored it back to that. The Vin Fizz is a Wright Model B airplane that was actually the first airplane to ever fly across the country. Uh, it was in a, in a race that was put on by William Hurst of uh, the Examiner and the Chicago Papers. Uh, the first person that could fly across the country would get thirty, no, fifty thousand dollars, 
And so the race was on and the Vin Fizz won the race coming from the East Coast to the West Coast, but it didn't do it in under 30 days, which was what the requirement was. It did it in more, I think it was closer to 45 days and somewhere around there. And so therefore didn't get the $50,000. All they got was the notoriety the of being, the, the glory of being the first person to ever fly across the country in an airplane. And we like to remind our visitors that when they're complaining about an hour or two delay to get to New York oh. on a five hour flight. Said, well, it took him 45 days. Oh. So, so we've come a long way with aviation. This airplane is the first airplane to ever land and take off on a ship. And it did it in 1911, and it did it right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it, it took off from the, the airport or the racetrack, Tan Fran, circled out over Oyster Point, and found the USS Pennsylvania moored right off of Yerba Buena Island, or in those days called Goat Island. And what they had done is they took the, 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 the ship and they, they built a 30 foot wide deck and 130 feet long. And then they put the sailor sea bags, they filled them with sand and they laid a rope across it. And they laid them across the deck and they, they, I think they put 30 of them across, down the deck. Mm -hmm. And on January 18th, 1911, Eugene Ely uh, made the first naval trap. Uh, catching the 13th of all the sea bags oh. and stopping within about three yards of the of the uh, the mass that they had put up uh, so he wouldn't hit the uh, smokestack on the ship but it did give him the the notoriety of being the very first person to ever land on a ship starting naval aviation okay. this this is a very famous airplane this is called the Lincoln Beachy little looper and it is the very first airplane to ever do a loop to go upside down in this country and it was flown by Eugene, um, Lincoln Beachy, who was a San Francisco native, and he would go all around the country and even to Europe and perform aerobatics. And he was so good at doing aerobatics that uh, he was considered at the time the greatest pilot in the world. Uh, and he, he would do loops and he would do rolls and he would do, he'd fly the airplane backwards by putting it straight up in the air and let it fall backwards. Oh. Um, he would race race cars uh, at Emeryville across the bay. He'd race Barney Oldfield in his car, oh, okay. and they used to race each other. Uh, he was a very, very talented pilot and um, really considered one of the greatest in the world at the time. That was one of the unique things about the, the uh, Little Looper is that it had a rotary engine. And what that means is the engine spun around with the propeller, as you can see. And so the propeller is attached to the crankshaft, and the engine spins with it. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons I think people say that they did that was for um, the inertia that it kept creating uh, with the, the engine spinning when you were trying to like fly the airplane because they didn't really have throttles in those days. So the, airplane, the engine was either full on or off. And by turning the airplane off uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the engine, this would keep the propeller spinning and keep the inertia going. So when it would come into land, sometimes you hear that in the old films of an airplane going, and eh, and. Eh. And that was the pilot turning the engine on and off. Our founder, Stanley Hiller Jr., uh, the reason why we're here and have such a beautiful museum, was a true pioneer in many, many ways. Uh, I think what's so interesting about him is he was a brilliant engineer and he was a brilliant businessman. And he started very early. When he was 14 years old, he had the Hiller Comet Racing Car Company. And we have some on display here. And they were he, little tiny, the little race cars that he went out and got the casting equipment for, bought casting equipment, and hired teenage kids to work for him and built these little race cars. And they would be on a tether line and they would go around in circles, but he, they were little uh, gas powered motors and little spark plugs and the whole deal. And he sold them for, it was like $28 a piece. So he's an entrepreneur. A very much an entrepreneur. So, and then he decided he wanted to build a helicopter. And the reason why he wanted to build a helicopter wasn't for what most people would think that he wanted to build a helicopter for the love of flight or the excitement. He wanted to build a helicopter because he saw a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the business opportunity was that in the uh, early 40s, there weren't really any helicopters. Just Igor Sikorsky was flying a helicopter on the East Coast. So he built this little helicopter, this little yellow helicopter here. That's a model of it we have in the museum. Uh, that uh, he flew in 1944, the very first uh, flight was on the 4th of July in 1944 over in Berkeley's uh, uh, Memorial Stadium. So he actually flew it in Berkeley Stadium. And now you think about that, not only did he build this helicopter, but then he had to fly it. Well, there were, no one could teach him how to fly it, there weren't any helicopter pilots. 
so he had to teach himself how to fly the helicopter. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of pictures of it up on its nose, on its side. He crashed the helicopter a lot also, but he got very, very good. They just kept rebuilding it, and he became a very proficient helicopter pilot, uh, even landing on rooftops in Berkeley. Uh, and he would uh, fly out in the valley, and he had a girlfriend up in Calusa. And when he'd go out there, he'd land it with pontoons in her swimming oh pool. Oh, my God. How, <laughs> so, how romantic. Yes, how romantic. And uh, he was a real pioneer in just a variety of different types of, of aircraft. He wasn't just settling on one particular thing. And the one, the, the platform, which we have the original one right here in the museum, this is the Hiller Flying Platform, probably the most requested item we get of people who want to build one. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, we don't give out the plans to it. But uh, this is the Hiller Flying Platform, and it's the closest thing to a magic carpet you'll ever get. It is a one-man uh, vertical flight aircraft, uh, and it is a flying platform. And what you see here is it, it's, a, it's a ring, and the ring is in the shape of a wing. And so it would pull the air over the wing with two counter-rotating blades in there, and it would create 40% of its lift by the air coming over the wing, and 60% of its lift by thrust, pushing the air down. It was kinesthetic control, whichever way you leaned was the direction it was going to go, and it would fly as high as you wanted to fall. Don't, don't <laughs> yeah. get dizzy. Don't get dizzy, and if you flew high, you want to make sure that the engine's still running. Uh, because if the engines quit, it came down like a rock. Uh, but it was a, a very successful in testing ducted fan technology, which is what the purpose of the design was in the first place, was to test ducted fan. I found your monitor there, you, it's a little uh, example of it, huh? Yes, yeah, and you could see um, that how uh, maneuverable it was and how uh -huh. easy it was to fly. It'd be fun. Yes, it? be very exciting, be very exciting. Talking about all these the young uh, geniuses, I guess, and um, I think that the youth of today are using a lot of the things you have, like the flight simulator. Right. And. Um, they didn't have those things when I was growing up, so I was hoping. <laughs> would you like to go fly? Oh, I'd like to go All right, let's take you up in the flight sim zone. You. Okay, let's go flying. Um, okay, so to turn, it's just like a wheel on a car right there, and you just go ahead and turn right. Oh. You're going to turn oh, this see. way. See, it's starting oh, to turn a little bit, nice and easy. Okay. And then so now go ahead and straighten it back out. And this is your horizon. So go ahead and straighten it, go in the opposite direction until you get the horizon level in the so screen you want here. Me to be level. Yeah, you want the horizon level. All right. And I'll push the nose down a little by pushing forward. I'm going to bring the power off just a little bit here so you're not climbing. Go ahead and put, oh, you just slide oh, it, slide it, slide it forward. There you go. Because you want to go right up here to that oh, runway. I do. I That's San Francisco hey, International it? Airport. Okay, up, back, and, and right. There you go. Oh, let's give it a little more power to get over there. That's okay. Push forward. Right. Yep, there you go. Just go straight level till we get over there. Back, back, because you're going down. You're 200 feet. Oh, back, back. You're at 100 feet. There you go. Okay, you got out of it. You're okay. Right about there. Oh, now you're going too high. Push it forward. <laughs> there you go. Now, okay, hold on. Oh, don't over Craig. Back, 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 back. Back. And then just kind of turn it left. Just hold it, hold it like that. Back. Okay, forward, 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 forward. forward. You're gonna come down now. That's okay. Down, back, guys. back, back, hold back, on. back, back, back. Oh, we bouncing forward. <laughs> that was a good bounce. Now you'll catch it. I remember one time. Okay, let it just float. Pull back, 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 back. Let it flow. Back, back. No, not forward. <laughs> okay. There you go. Back. So, yeah, that's the reason why you don't let her fly you anymore? <laughs> there you go, look at that. Yeah, you're on the ground. You made it. It's San Francisco International Airport. Yay! You were talking earlier about the 747, which you have a portion of one out in the, the yard out there. And since I know how to fly, I think, you know, I'd like to try the 747 now. There you go. See how I do with that.
rolling. To fly. Haven't we all looked up with fascination at wonderful air machines passing overhead? I barely hear you.